Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Excellent. Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thanks to not only our panelists, but also to the attendees. You're why we're doing this. My name is David Thaddeus Baker. I'm a writer and editor for the Louisiana Weekly newspaper here in New Orleans. And today I'll be speaking with a couple of our leaders in economic development and community development about how we can improve our city. Today's discussion is called I Am New Orleans. It is the first in a series of discussions about a community-led campaign to inspire conversation and action around key issues of racial equity that impact our next generation. Uh, we thank the Kellogg, W.K. Kellogg Foundation for its support. And so I'm going to get into our panelists now. Today we'll be joined by Flazel Daniels, the president and CEO of Foundation for Louisiana, Thelma French, president and CEO of Total Community Action, Lamar Gardier, executive director of the Data Center, Hermian Malone, executive director of Good Work Network, and Quentin Messer, president and CEO of New Orleans Business Alliance. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Great Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I'd like to give also a few housekeeping notes to our audience and to our panelists. Please keep your microphones muted if you are not speaking at the time to cut down on background noise. We are recording this session for anyone who wasn't able to attend and for the people who are here. So just note that we will be recording that video will be made available at the conclusion of this panel discussion. If you are joining us through social media or engaging with us through social media, you can tag the conversation at hashtag I am New Orleans and visit us at I am New Orleans stories .com for more information after the events. So we're going to begin by letting each panelist go ahead and give a little bit of information about themselves and their organization. Flozell, we'll begin with you. Fantastic. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really glad to be here. I'm Flozell Daniels, Jr., President and CEO of the Foundation for Louisiana, where our mission is to invest in people and practices that work to build a stronger Louisiana. I'm really pleased to join this conversation. Next, we'll hear from Thelma French. Ms. French. Good afternoon. I'm Thelma Harris French, the President and CEO of Total Community Action Incorporated. We are the city's official anti poverty agency created out of the 1964 War on Poverty. Our current vision is that New Orleans has viable pathways for all individuals and families to achieve financial stability, self sufficiency, and ultimately prosperity. And we believe that TCA can be a catalyst for generating community-wide change to ensure that the pathways are provided opportunities for low-income families. So our focus is those, the least of these in our community. Thank you. Lamar, we're gonna move to you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lamar Gardier, the executive director of the Data Center. The Data Center is a data intermediary. Uh, what that means is that we are listening to conversations around the city that uh, decision makers are having, that folks at the community level are having. Uh, and whenever we hear conversations that are happening without data or without good data, uh, that's when we jump in to inject uh, high quality data and analysis to help guide that decision making so that those decisions are made uh, in an informed way uh, so that we are moving uh, towards greater prosperity for our region. We've been operating in Southeast Louisiana uh, since about 1997. Uh, and in general, we're looking to create broader prosperity in the region through data. Thanks for joining everybody. Thank you, Lamar. Hermian. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hermian Malone. I'm executive director of Good Work Network, where we coach minority and women-owned businesses from survival to success through access to skills development, contracts and capital for growth and networks to scale. Uh, we believe that when all small business owners have equal access to what they need to succeed and prosper, we will have a more diverse, inclusive and equitable economy. Happy to be here today. And Mr. Messer. Great afternoon. Clearly I didn't get the virtual wallpaper memo, but um, <laughs> that's okay. I'll, I'll deal with being the, the lonely guy um, Quentin Messer Jr., New Orleans Business Alliance. I work with a tremendous team 
focus on reimagining economic development such that economic development is more uh, inclusive, promotes social mobility, and affords uh, more opportunity for job candidates. Pleased to be here. Excellent. So just to give you a bit more background for, well, for the audience, I know the panelists all understand what the I Am New Orleans campaign is. Um, we're going to be digging into the issue of economic dignity and what that means. Um, it's the, what, what it means and the impact of, for the opportunities for our kids moving forward. It's the first in a series of conversations. This conversation particularly is called Economic Dignity, a Vision for New Orleans. And now I think we're ready. We're going to begin with a five minute video. We can go ahead and roll that. New Orleans knows what it feels like to be a top three economy. Like we actually know what that feels like. How we got there the first time was through an extractive economy, right? Slavery. And then from agriculture to oil and gas to hospitality. And so now it's about getting back to a top economy, nationally and globally, but doing it through an inclusive approach. The New Orleans Business Alliance, or NOLA BA, is the city's public-private partnership for economic development and workforce development. We are an economic development organization that really builds connections where we help everybody see that all of the folks in New Orleans are assets and that we're solution makers in getting to kind of a strong, inclusive economy. NOLA BA has been really critical in helping to shape some of those strategies successfully. Working with nonprofits, community development, financial institutions, philanthropy, and other government agencies to really help move those strategies. The four work streams that drive our day-to-day -day work now are business attraction and retention, small business growth um, with an emphasis on high growth entrepreneurs of color, talent and workforce development, and then place-based development. We call it strategic neighborhood development. Seventy-one percent of New Orleans' African-American families are living below a living wage, as opposed to 31 percent of uh, white households below a living wage. Put it in perspective, New Orleans is 300 years old. 150 years of it was in slavery. 100 years of it was in that uh, Jim Crow era. Uh, it's only in the last 50 years where it was even possible for African-American New Orleanians to fully participate in the economy. People don't have equal access to opportunity, to resources. It puts them behind the curve. Currently in our city, we still have an unemployment rate of about 47% for African-American men. Our space in the workforce has been in this space of innovation. What are the needs that people have, that job seekers have, that serve as barriers to either finding a job, getting a job, or keeping a job? We found that if we look at New Orleans and who's in New Orleans and who's unemployed, who's coming here, it's a large uh, people who are formerly incarcerated. Um, now that people are changing some of the laws and reducing mass incarceration, people are returning back to the city, they need jobs and opportunities. But also, how do we address the employer expectations and needs? So Strive was able to become that conduit to make sure that people have this opportunity. This is career pathway. How can you advance every year? How can you now look at a career pathway outside of going to college? I had always had aspirations to be a business owner. What I've noticed is a lot of entities down here sort of marginalize black businesses. NOLA BA's focus is to turn $1 million businesses to $10 million businesses. Growing the business, like, it takes a whole nother type of consultation. You know, it takes a whole nother type of access to markets. 
We're getting real world education on how to expand business. We see a different New Orleans now uh, with a possibility and opportunity and uh, people thinking differently about what we can do uh, in this moment. There's tremendous civic energy here in New Orleans now that we didn't see when, when we were younger. Uh, we all want to capture that energy. What does the future of New Orleans look like if it could be its fully equitable self? The ability to have economic dignity. For people who own businesses, they can compete. They have fair access to capital and relationships and partnerships. For people who work every day, they have fair wages. They have benefits. They have um, professional relationships that edify them and don't deny them justice. There we are. Can you guys hear me? Follow my own rule a little too well. Okay, so New Orleans is often referred to as a Black city. It has an amazing culture, a rich history, and a large population of Black Americans who have directly contributed to the city and state's economic vitality at every stage since 1718. Lamar, paint a picture for us of what the city looks like now in terms of, of the economics and the people. If we're talking about economic dignity, where does the city and its Black population stand more than 300 years later? Oh, thank you for that question, David. Um, we could go in a lot of different directions talking about the context and who New Orleans is and why it is what it is right now. But for this conversation, I think it makes sense if we uh, focus on employment for the moment. And I think there's a slide that's available if we can have that up. Um, and what I wanna to point to here, this is a graph of employment from 1980 uh, to 2016. And importantly, I'm not talking about unemployment rates, I'm talking about employment rates. Employment rates do a better job of really capturing who's working and who's not in the city. So we have here working age adults uh, from 16 to 64 by race. And we can see that from 1980 to 1990, uh, we saw a pretty significant decline in employment for men, uh, for black men, for white men, for Hispanic men. Um, and so when you think about what's happening in New Orleans and where the problems started, I mean, we could go back and chronicle it throughout 300 year history, but in modern times, you can see this decline from 1980 to 1990, really setting the context for the issues that we're dealing with today. Um, and if your eyes track down to, to the chart below, you can see that this decline in, in male uh, employment uh, tracked pretty well with the decline of the port and oil and gas industry jobs over that same decade from 1980 to 1990. Uh, these were good uh, unionized jobs that were providing family sustaining wages to you know, mostly men um, of all races. Um, now, what I want you to notice is that uh, first of all, women were improving during this time period and continue to improve up through 2016. Uh, in 1990, you start to see a recovery in male employment, uh, such that everyone has improved their employment rate except for Black men. We see that Black men uh, from 1980 on through 2016 have had consistently decreasing employment rates, uh, going from 63% down to 52%. Many of the problems that we uh, know of now and challenges that we face now are tied to this particular issue around black male employment. Um, if you compare this to, to uh, our national counterparts, um, white men and white women and Hispanic uh, women are doing better locally than their national counterparts, uh, Hispanic men, uh, and both black men and women are worse off than our national counterparts. Uh, but you know, this issue around jobs is, is tied to the small business um, concept. So if we can go to that slide next. One of the things that we know is that uh, a great way of ensuring that there's greater employment for minorities 
uh, is to have more minority-owned businesses. Minority-owned businesses tend to hire more minorities, more people from the community. And so, uh, you know, so, so many folks would ask for and look for ways to improve uh, small businesses and small business growth, particularly minority-owned business growth in New Orleans. Uh, many of you may have seen this slide before or this data before. It's uh, saying that over a, a, a period from 1997 to 2012, 40% um, of businesses in New Orleans were black owned. But over that same time period, they only accounted for 2% of receipts. And sadly, over the entire period, it was stuck at 2% the entire time, right? So in 1997, it was 2%. In 2012, it was still 2%, right? And so what's happening with this? How can we have an increase in, in Black businesses over that time period, but still be stuck at 2%? Uh, and so we dug into this number a little bit to try to understand it. And what it reveals is that uh, when you look at uh, businesses that have employees, that number drops from 40% of businesses being Black owned to only 3.9% of businesses being Black owned. Meanwhile, 75.8% of businesses with paid employees are white owned. Uh, so that reveals uh, a little bit about why um, uh, revenue would be stuck at 2% and why we are having trouble with male, with Black male employment if the small businesses, the Black owned businesses, aren't growing and, and, and aren't able to hire uh, people significantly. If we could go to the next slide, I got just a couple of more slides to give it a bit more texture. Uh, here you can see in the, the dark purple is um, black owned businesses, the light purple is white owned businesses. You can see a significant difference in scale in terms of the number of, uh, of black and white businesses here who, are, who have receipts that are over 250 thousand or over 500,000. Um, and, you know, this paints its own picture, right? You know, so in general, Black folks, uh, Black businesses are having a tough time growing and earning uh, uh, greater receipts, whereas we see far more uh, white-owned businesses uh, earning even over a million dollars in terms of receipts. Um, locally, we have something like 6,300 um, white owned businesses earning over a million, whereas we have only 160 black owned businesses earning over a million. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please, that would be great. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, could we go back just once? I wanna point out one more thing on here before we move on. Um, so when you look at the businesses who are earning over 250, you can see that there's a gap, right? It's 52% of black firms, are earning over 250, 68% of white uh, firms are, over, are earning over 250, but the gap really jumps when we get over $500,000 uh, with, uh, with only 28% of black firms earning over 500,000 and 50% of white uh, firms um, earning over 500,000. So we see that, that earnings gap between businesses just growing as earnings increase. Next slide, please. Similarly, uh, we see the numbers of uh, Black businesses who were able to stay open for five years or more uh, being significantly less than white-owned businesses. Uh, you know, we can talk about the percentages, but here it's probably important to talk about the scale. This is a majority Black city, yet 7,800 uh, white-owned businesses have been open for more than five years, uh, and only 253 of those of, of black owned businesses have been open for more than five years. So we see significant problems in the small business climate uh, as it relates to what minority owned black owned businesses are able to do. And that's in turn contributing to the um, employment, particularly male employment issues, black male employment issues that we see here in New Orleans. Um, I think this paints a good landscape uh, for what needs to happen around workforce development, policy, small business support, and things like that. Okay, thank you. So to follow up to that, let's 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 turn to Quentin and Thelma. Quentin, what would you say accounts for those percentages of black companies not doing as well as white companies here in New Orleans? What are you seeing in terms of the the determinants? Sure, thank you for the question, David, and to Lamar and his team for the data. Look, I think there are three big picture points, and obviously I want to get out the way and and learn from um, Mrs. French. Um, one, uh, we, we, we see the historical legacies of uh, the degradation from Jim Crow, from discriminatory lending policies. So we see that. 
I think the second thing is, is that we have not had necessarily the ability to have the catalytic projects that other Southern cities have had in which there were opportunities for contracting or things of that nature. A lot of people point to Atlanta and what happened with the construction of Hartsville Jackson Airport. Now we know everything isn't imperfect perfect in Atlanta, but it did create companies like Herman Russell and others that got to sufficient health that they were able. They were also able to take advantage of the fact that they had a large corporate base from which they could have procurement opportunities, whether it was Coca-Cola or Southern companies or other, they had a pipeline of private sector procurement opportunities. And I think the final um, event is we have not seen the type of large scale exit event that transforms communities. What I mean by exit, I mean either through initial public offering or through a strategic exit. And I would argue that if you look at what happened with Austin post Dell, when Dell went public, it created 2,700 millionaires. That fundamentally changes the landscape of a city. So I think it's, no, it's not necessarily ironic that one of the wealthiest black folks on the planet, Robert Johnson, Robert Smith, I'm sorry, the headquarter of his private equity firm, Vista Equity Partners is in Austin, Texas. So we haven't necessarily had the flywheel effect that comes from having those strategic exits. So I would think those are the three causal factors. Okay. There are many other, but those were the three I would flag. Uh, Selma French, Ms. French, what are you hearing from the community about what they feel are the factors that are impacting their, their success? What have, what have you heard of the barriers? Okay, in our most recent community survey, the number one barrier is the lack of income and the Louisiana minimum wage. Uh, we still have a city with a lot of minimum wage employees. And I think that it, it should be noted that at the current minimum wage, a person can work 52 weeks a year and earn and have one child and earn less than the federal poverty level. And so that is to some extent a disincentive to work. The other issue, and I think Quentin has alluded to it, and that's economic segregation. The ability to access or to participate in economic growth from small business to large business and participation in the process. We have a couple other issues that are on the social side that need to be brought up. And uh, the one, uh, one that's key to me is our education and workforce training systems and the disconnects and uh, the missing, some of our missing opportunities. While we felt that post Katrina, the revision of accountability and the creation of a more diverse uh, education system would bring more equity in education. We still, our children are still lagging behind their counterparts regionally and nationally. Uh, the other issues are transportation, which has continuously been a part of our social segregation, uh, the access to transportation on a regional basis and a true regional transportation system. And I know that my colleague is working hard to try to get us to a regional transportation system, but we're, we're still not there. And so some of, uh, and I look at the Delgado Avondale campus, which would provide high skill training opportunities for low income individuals to be able to make higher wages, yet we still don't have a 24 hour or 11 hour childcare system. So as a community, we haven't wrapped that link around addressing the social determinants comprehensively. So uh, Flozell, Foundation for Louisiana does a lot of work in this regard with helping to support campaigns that do try to create these ways for people to be successful. What, what are, what, in, in terms of the barriers that have just been laid out by Quentin and by Thelma, what can we do to overcome that? Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's an awesome responsibility we have. And, um, you know, a couple of things that I'm thinking about. One, COVID has reminded us that the structure of our economic system doesn't actually work for our people. 
Mm -hmm. Many of us didn't need that reminder before COVID, but here we are in this historic moment, understanding that these systems don't actually work to protect people and their families, which then undermines the entire community. You know, I think one of the things we have to figure out is how to actually work collaboratively. We all say that. Um, I think what's exciting about this I am New Orleans campaign and the leadership of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation is pushing us to really reassert um, the fact that we need to actually work together. One of the lessons we've learned at Foundation for Louisiana um, is that um, the importance of working across sectors. And that means not only having a cross-sectoral or intersectoral analysis, but it really means that our practices allow us to not only envision a future together, but to test each other's ideas across different areas of work. Ms. French just mentioned, for instance, how poorly designed and managed our transportation system has been historically. As chair of that board, I'm taking that lick and things are being put in place. But one of the lessons that we're trying to practice at the Regional Transit Authority is, if we're gonna do this work, we also have to be in touch with the folk who are doing housing policy and investment work. Where are the folks who are doing workforce who understand where the jobs are? How do we work with school systems, um, both K-12 and above, to make sure that people can not only get to work, but they can get to educational and training um, opportunities. And of course, healthcare, there's a real need for us across all of our sectors, public and private, certainly with philanthropy and the most important sector community uh, to understand how we can pull ourselves together to not only get better outcomes, but also to mitigate um, unintended consequences. I, I will say this, and, and I'm hoping we, we get to be courageous in this conversation. And I really appreciate Lamar leading us off with the data. We are gonna have to have a discussion about New Orleans being a black city and what that means. The history uh, that was shown in the, the video is critical. The truth is the wealth of this community in many ways was built on the backs and brains of black folks. If we were having a, if this were a public health initiative, we'd be looking at data to say we should be focused on population. We should be making every decision across all sectors framed by a question, how will this enrich black folk in New Orleans? Because if we don't do that, we're not gonna make the progress that we need to make from an economic development perspective. So how have we gotten started on that so far? How have we gotten started on that? Yeah, like working cross collaboratively in terms of like putting together plans and, and well, you, activating. You, yeah, yeah, you see you see great initiatives, right? So the mm -hmm. fact that we're all on this call together, we represent different sectors. We, we these are the folks who work together um, every day. If I, you know, if I had to elevate some specific things that I've seen actually shift and move uh, the work, you know, um, initiatives like the mobilization fund, right? If you look at the first source initiative that the city of New Orleans set forth. Um, a few years ago with the airport, what you found was a very detailed partnership oriented approach that capitalized properly the initiative to make sure resources were available. All sectors were involved so that we could uh, make sure the design elements were gonna work for people and which you could measure the resources that were, the wealth that was transferred to black owned businesses in a very measurable way. We have to do more of those kinds of things. So speaking of black owned businesses and other small owned businesses, what we've seen as a result of this pandemic is that, as you mentioned, our communities are more vulnerable than others. When we experience natural disasters, man-made disasters, pandemics, mm -hmm. what resources are available currently for those small business owners? We've seen that it was maybe 2% or less of black owned businesses actually benefited from PPP from the PPP and the CARES Act and you know the next round is coming up. I don't know how many people will actually be able to participate in that on the basis of eligibility. But what have we put in place to ensure that things like those types of occurrences that happen and it don't put black and brown owned businesses in well further strain when we're already up against so many other barriers. And um, Hermie and I, we would love to hear from you about this concern that you are running Good Work Network and Lozelle. Hermie, let's go to you first. Okay. Um, you know, you, you talked about it in the context of disasters, whether they be, you know, weather-related natural climate disasters or economic disasters like the pandemic. 
Um, I guess I would say those aside, to me, the greatest disaster and historical factor outside of control of communities of color is really the ongoing lack of will of the majority in this country uh, to do what's right by all of its people. Um, so I, a researcher I was reading recently pointed out, you know, if you're in a society where you already let somebody go without shelter, then what does it matter if they drown, right? And so when we look at things like the ineffectiveness of the initial PPP rollout, um, I don't think that any of us who work with small businesses, particularly black businesses, were surprised at the outcomes. Um, when you set up a system that's created by people who have historically used their power and position to benefit those that look like them, you expect the greatest beneficiary of whatever program, initiative, service that they're offering will be to benefit those that look like them. And so I think none of that was surprising, though disappointing. One of the ways to get to um, more effective use of resources like that, a better response post-disaster, is to not look at a universal solution to problems that affect people disparately, right? So we've all seen that, that equity cartoon where you've got kids behind a fence and somebody's shorter so they're standing on you know, more blocks. I think you've got to take the same approach with solutions to support small businesses. So the approach you see the Biden administration announcing this week, which is to create some preferential parameters for smaller businesses. Almost 90% of small businesses in this country have 20 people or less. Mm -hmm. And what's the story that we heard in the entire first rollout of PPP? We heard about these mega corporations taking all of the funding. 90%, black, white, other, of small businesses in this country have 20 people or less. So the solution we're seeing this week is the rollout that we should have had the first time around. So I will say that one of the things that we can demand is a non-across-the-board uh, approach to, mm -hmm. to solutions, to recognize absolutely all businesses are suffering, but some more than others. And where there is an opportunity to address that disparate outcome with a solution that targets who's hurting the most, We've got to have the will, and when I say we, honestly what I'm saying is the white leadership of this country has to have the will to say helping some of us is going to help all of us, and whether that person looks like me or not, if they are starting out behind, there are resources that we need to think about dedicating to their recovery that are not going to be the same that we're offering to a multi-billion dollar corporation. Yeah. In terms of, I'm sorry, go on, Pluto. No, I was just gonna say, uh, Hermione's hit, I think the, the nail on the head and the, and the challenge we have in this region that I think can be an opportunity is because we have so many kinds of different disasters, it multiplies the vulnerability. And so we've gotta be able to respond pre-disaster with resources, you know, I'm looking in the chat, lots of people are talking about access to capital yeah. and equity in particular. So one of the responses we've seen time and again, post-disaster, which can mean anything in Louisiana, is, well, let's offer some more debt to small businesses right. that were probably struggling to service their debt even before the disaster. We've got to shift the paradigm. I think we have to work both in the private sector with philanthropy and others to make more equity available Mm -hmm. to the kinds of businesses that don't often meet the sexiness factor. You know, we like to talk about technology. We like to talk about the big, the big projects and the big hits, and those are really important. But part of this economic dignity conversation that we're learning from uh, people on the ground is they want to be able to raise their families. They want to be able to own a home or some land. They want to be able to have a small business if that's their thing. And that means having access to capital and, and listen, uh, we're gonna have to challenge ourselves because the current models of, well, go to the bank or go, uh, um, our CFI partners are struggling because they don't have access to capital. We're gonna have to put in those lanes access to equity capital that's gonna allow black owned businesses. And Hermione has uh, the pipeline for them, 
right? Camelback Ventures, um, uh, Propeller, the Urban League. It's, we, we, we're not missing, uh, we have lots of talent as far as where are those businesses coming from and where do they exist? What's really missing is that capital, something we're gonna have to solve for. So when you bring up capital and the, the groups that you just named, Another point about that is that there is, New Orleans isn't a huge city. We often find ourselves in competition for the same very little resources. What are these business owners to do if there's a limited amount here though? Like how, how, how are we recruiting additional resources to the city? I, 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 I was just gonna be like I, a Clinton question. Since <laughs> no idea is on the forefront of doing business retention. What, what are the strategies that y'all have found effective? Sure, um, let me address that point. So one of the things we're doing is clearly uh, we're trying to work with uh, national organizations like the Kellogg Foundation. I think Kellogg's mm -hmm. been tremendous because not only have they put on opportunities like this, but to Hermian's point and some of the other points that have been raised, they developed the business case for racial equity and which makes that argument that Hermian and others about which they have spoken is that we're all less prosperous than we should be. I think secondly, uh, kudos to JP Morgan Chase and the investment in Liberty. So we talked about um, equity and a lot of people think equity and it's a trigger and, and I've seen people lose their lunch over equity, but it was really Christy Slater who sort of talks about the duality of the definition of equity. One is, is the quality of being fair or impartial. Hermian talked about the visible, the visual example. The second one was the value of shares issued by a company. So I think a lot of things in the chat is really how do we stimulate greater ownership? Mm -hmm. And I think we have to do that by attracting capital, not only from philanthropy, because philanthropy alone won't do it, but we have to continue to make the argument to local businesses, but we have to be sanguine about the fact that our business community is not the size it should be for some of the reasons that Lamar outlined before, but we also have to begin to wait, work with the growing pool of black and brown and indigenous and other venture capitalists and private equity folks who are willing to invest and have equity investments, long-term equity investments, in um, BIPOC entrepreneurs. And just one last thing, a plug for what the Business Alliance is doing and shout out to Lynette White Colon and other members of our team with Invest NOLA. There are a cohort of 13 BIPOC businesses who have gone through and you saw one of the, one of the gentlemen in the video who have sacrificed time, effort and treasure to go through executive education and they are focused on growing their businesses profitably. And I think that that's an encouraging sign. Look, we, we are behind, a lot of time has not, uh, but I, I hope people are not despondent nor become discouraged. Um, this is another moment. I know that people are sick of saying moments, but this crisis that COVID has brought us to, the racial reckoning, and climate change, and I think climate change is something where we have a real opportunity to do, to be able to do differently and to get a lot of our businesses focused on the opportunity that's going to open. And while we're working on that, what can we do to better support and make sure that our population, as we just saw from the data at the beginning of this through that, that videos, the unemployment rate <clears throat> amongst African-Americans, Black men particularly, is very high. How are we making resources available? Are the information about resources available to them are doing workforce development or whatever we need to do to ensure that we pull people out of unemployment or underemployment, which is actually a, another really huge issue that I don't feel gets discussed enough. How do we shore up those communities in that time between where we are now and then getting to a point where we have million dollar companies on every corner. This question go to either of you. 
David, I'm going to jump in as the workforce professional in the room. And I think that one of the first things is that we have to look at who are the unemployed. And we need to stop trying to have a one a pathway fit all. Uh, we are still the state that has incarcerated more individuals than any nation in the world. And we still have a large population of our community who are returning, all who were not incarcerated for serious criminal effective. We have to have multiple pathways that allow people not only the dignity, but the ability to earn a living wage and be on a continuous growth pattern. And I think that when Flozell began to talk about the project at the airport, I felt very proud to know that that was a project that went from the entry level worker all the way up to the small business developer. And it was an accountability based process throughout. And as I go back and I think about post Katrina and the pains that I felt when people came in in cars and trucks every week to rebuild my city, yet New Orleans were here and couldn't get a job. We have to hold ourselves and our policymakers accountable. We must ensure that procedures, there are places in state law and city law where we can hold accountability, but also we have to hold our businesses accountable. And so this whole collective act impact that we're hoping this conversation will start has to lead to a collective action. I'm too old to talk about just talking anymore. It's time for us to make a permanent. Uh, as usual, David, I love to follow Ms. French, uh, who, who's taught me half of everything I know already. Um, I, I would add to that, you know, we have some power, and this maybe goes to Quentin's point, we have power that we are not exercising enough of. So you've got public sector employment, we can decide to pay people a living wage. That will have implications. We will have to think about what revenue generation looks like at the tax level, but this is important for us both um, at, at the city, at the state, inside of agencies. It's a conversation we certainly have had at the Transit Authority and, and will continue to push for. We also have policy authority from a land use and zoning and permitting perspective with the private sector. Now, listen, this is Black History Month. It's 2021 and if you all don't think we're in a civil rights crisis the way we were in the 50s and 60s, uh, there's a reason why all of us have these, this, this amazing uh, young girl in our backgrounds to talk about the courage it's gonna take and so much of that was policy work. So we get to say, if you're gonna get a permit, if you're gonna get a subsidy for your corporation to develop jobs in this region, we wanna make sure that they're good paying jobs that have benefits. And until we get to that point, uh, we're acting as if we don't have abundance. We absolutely have abundance. We need to start having some expectations uh, for what it means to actually do business in the greater New Orleans area. David, can I just add that something that I think um, often gets left out of these conversations is the private sector. So there is a lot of um, policy work and data that is derived from public sector um, initiatives and opportunities, but the vast majority of procurement happening in any market is private sector. And so when we think about how infrequently we are calling uh, corporate New Orleans to task to engage and diversify their supply chains, that's another tremendous opportunity and resource that we are not leveraging. And I'll just give you a quick example of how simple this can be to push back on old practices. I was in a conversation this month with a corporate entity I will not name, and that corporate entity was attempting to try to address a problem about slow paying its suppliers. So imagine getting a contract, you start the work, it takes 60 days to get your first payment. And there was a very elaborate solution this person was developing, and I said, why don't you just lower the net pay days? Why can't you pay people in 30 days? Why isn't that the internal work happening inside your corporation so that you can actually engage and sustain more small businesses as your suppliers? And so that entire sector is where we also, it's a both and, need to be pushing. But I just wanted to bring that up because a tremendous contract opportunity for the growth of small businesses is really going to come from private sector. And if we let them off the hook by focusing only on contracting opportunities with um, state governments and local municipalities, we are leaving tremendous money and opportunity on the table. 
Carmen, would you happen to have some form of a, a toolkit for accountability when it comes to working with these corporate giants that can be used by the people on this call by just regular citizens who want to go out and advocate on behalf of small businesses? I'm happy to work something up. I, I, I know this from having worked in supplier diversity, but I will say that one of the things to push for is internal accountability. Um, as it relates to, to the private sector, one of the great things kind of is that they can do whatever they want. Whereas sometimes in public sector, this is gonna require changes in, in law and regulation. A corporate entity can decide tomorrow it has a 12% supplier diversity goal and start working on it. The downside is you have far less visibility so as an outside agitator, you really do need somebody also partnering with you on the inside who knows the systems and processes and can push. I am happy at any time to talk to anyone who has an interest in agitating for more corporate social responsibility or if there are corporations on the call who are trying to think about how to advance their inclusive procurement practices, also happy to have those conversations. Excellent. We're coming close to the time where we need to wrap up. So what I'm gonna do is transition after this final question to taking a few audience questions. I'm just waiting to get them from. Okay, here's this one. Um, we answered this one. Okay, I have a question from the audience. How do you think the current economic crisis and unemployment rates will impact these employment trends moving forward? Juan for Lamar. I can speak on that just, just for a moment. Um, and maybe there are others who uh, could provide some color as well. But uh, while this is a very uncertain time and it's not exactly clear, how employment trends will be impacted. What we do know is that disasters always exacerbate and accelerate existing trends. What you saw earlier was that the existing trend was that the folks who are doing well will uh, are you know continuing to do better, right? And, and the folks who are struggling, um, and that you know maybe black males, black women, um, uh, Hispanic, uh, men and women, minorities of all type, uh, continue to struggle in the city. Uh, during disasters, the trend suggests that they would continue to have a hard time, in fact, have a harder time. And so what disasters always show is folks who are doing well continue to do better. Folks who are uh, struggling continue to struggle even more. So without some direct and intentional intervention to bring up minorities uh, and provide some direct help to those folks, uh, we would expect those trends to just be accelerated for folks to continue having trouble. Thank you. Another question around affordable housing. We all know that affordable housing is key to living a high quality of life. How can we create more affordable housing for Blacks in New Orleans city limits? Does COVID open any options for it? That's a, that's a tough one. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly um, point out that, you know, I think about the 90s when, when I worked in city government, we had what Ms. French nearly 26, $27 million in, in different kinds of CDBG or community development block grant money. We had other resources. Uh, that number is down last time I checked, you know, it might be 11 to $12 million. And so what you've seen by way of federal policy and funding is a reduction in availability in addition to reduced investment at the local level. It's created a real challenge from the development of, of affordable housing. Um, and then quite candidly, I think we have some some policies and some practices that need some updating with regard to uh, the disposition of land and properties in the post-Katrina environment um, in the creation of affordability. We, we need more resources and we need more creativity in the industry to create more affordability. Excellent. How can we and are we going to reverse the black brain drain and turn it into black brain gain? I, I, I hate to speak so much, and maybe Lamar has data on whether there's a drain or a gain. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, though, and, and actually Nola B.A. did an analysis on this years ago with the data center, is that we have very many 
well-educated, talented, and trained people in this community. Um, I'm looking at the chat. I want to make sure we're not just talking about Black folk. We're talking about everyone who's been left at the margins. But the question was about Black folk. There are lots of very talented Black folk here. They are still not getting access to high quality jobs. They're still not getting access to capital. You know, the data on this question is uh, hard to sift through, but I think, uh, Flozea, your, your, your points are clear, though, that there isn't as much uh, access to opportunity here for, for Black folks as, uh, as you would see in some other more prosperous cities. I think Quentin may have spoken to it earlier about the types of jobs that are available here. We're, we are a city that is dominated by hospitality and tourism type jobs. Those are ones that overwhelmingly pay below uh, a family sustaining wage, right? We would have to have an economy that was far more diversified offering, you know, wages that um, allow people to earn in a way uh, that would allow them to support their families. And to be clear in New Orleans, uh, to support one adult, one child, that's about $23 an hour, right? I know the conversation is around 15, but in New Orleans, $23 an hour is what's required to support a family sustaining wage here in New Orleans for one adult, one child. Uh, we need the kinds of jobs that would support those kinds of wages. If we expect for people uh, who are talented and you know, have abilities and such to stay in our city. Uh, and so that becomes a, a, a question of how do we grow certain types of businesses? How do we target certain types of businesses to, to come here? How do we grow uh, local talent to uh, create the, the businesses and in, in industries and sectors that would pay more? How do we use our natural talents here, here in New Orleans around um, entertainment and um, uh, performance and things like that to, to do the kinds of things that places like Nashville have done right around music production and such uh, so that we, we have higher, um, we have the types of jobs that professionals can go into and earn above that, that, uh, that family sustaining wage. I think without those kinds of opportunities, it's going to be hard to retain the tremendous talent that we have here in New Orleans. So what then can public schools be doing currently to prepare K through 12 students to transition into either our entrepreneurship or working for any business or even government? What can, what can our schools be doing better? I would, I would jump in and say, participate in the conversations. I think that we are too siloed in our planning and conversations. As Lamar and Flozell just spoke, I went from thinking about how we treat our cultural economy, our cultural barrier, ba uh, barriers and how we lack support for them to also thinking about advanced manufacturing. And when eight years ago, we were gonna make major investments in advanced manufacturing, but we never have a table or a collective table that reflects from the cradle to post-employment. As educators or former educators, we want to sit at an education table only. I think school leaders, school policymakers must join these collective tables to talk about what is economic dignity for New Orleans and what is our role. You know, the role of education is to prepare young people to succeed. It is not to be an isolated incident in life, so. Okay, so we're gonna go to a couple of final thoughts from our panelists. We come to the end of our time. Um, just let's think about what is the goal for the future of New Orleans and how do we get there? Let's, let's hear from you guys. Any final thoughts? All right. I'll well, start calling people then. Herman, <laughs> don't, don't start calling us, David. Uh, let me listen. I'm, I am uh, completely gratified to be a part of what is the beginning of a conversation. We want to make sure my understanding from all of us, from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and others, is that this is an invitation for everyone to join this conversation. Some of us have the privilege of doing this work every day. And, and listen, we're going to have to move with courage. We're going to have to talk about well-paying jobs. I really appreciate someone in the chat said union jobs. These are things that sometimes are politically untenable in Louisiana, but we're gonna to have to be honest with ourselves about how high quality jobs get made and the role that industry plays sometimes in pushing back on good salaries and benefits. I think we also are going to have to answer the question, 
about more equity for small businesses at every level that's been discussed here. People on this call are much better experts than I am on that. Um, and last is courageous public policy. We're gonna have to make sure the public sector is working well, even while we try to convince our friends in the private sector uh, to come along for the ride. Anyone else? Um, you know, we started out talking about economic dignity, which for me is a is a is about deserving, right? That there is nothing I can do to deserve the right to a life of purpose. But similarly, no one has the right to deem me undeserving. And so, um, you know, Slazel talked about equity. This this sense that um, we are all deserving of you know jobs. If we want to start a business, starting that. Um, the ability to create and pass down wealth. And so really this, this zero-sum thinking um, that opportunity for me uh, means nothing for you, that if I win, you lose that thinking um, that's created these systems that have perpetuated these inequities is really the thing that has to change. And I think we have to try to you know, muster the will and, and hold those without the will to account um, for dismantling so many of these systems that really are robbing so many talented people, whether it has to do with the, uh, getting a job or creating a business. It is not a lack of ideas or talent or hustle or drive. Uh, it, it's these, these undeserving um, barriers that have been put into place for people. So my hope would be that we could see, we could see the dismantling of those and the calling out of them as they are um, and developing the will to hold those to account who can do something about them. Man. <clears throat> okay, I'd like to state that my vision or my hope is as Flozell stated, this is the beginning of a conversation that leads to an actionable initiative. When I say actionable, I think it will be several collective tables, but that we all are working toward one vision, and that is the ability for every citizen of this city to have economic dignity, to feel that there is an opportunity or a pathway to achieve those goals. And so on behalf of the panelists, myself, and the team that helped plan this, we want to just start this. We There is no bigger moment than the moment we have today. And we can't wait till the next disaster or the next pandemic to start talking about this. Absolutely. Anyone else before I close out? Okay, so in closing, we'd like to, of course, thank all of our panelists for participating today, as well as our attendees, very much so our attendees. You are the reason that we are doing this. Please remember to visit IamNewOrleansVoices.com, where you will find the video that we played at the beginning of this discussion, as well as a recording of today's conversation and additional resources that can help to answer any of these questions that you have. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to us. And the conversation doesn't end here. As we said at the start, this is a, the first in a series of discussions. Registration is already open for the next installment of this conversation series. That one's on lactation consultants, a labor of love. Join us on March 11th, and we will discuss the importance of culturally relevant maternal and child health. Fantastic. Thank you, David. Thanks, everybody. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. It was truly a pleasure. Thank you.